Today we're going to discuss the non-tender deadline for the Detroit Tigers. we got to talk about the decisions that were made. We're also going to talk about the decisions that were made throughout the rest of baseball and some players that are now free agents that weren't just a few days ago. And then we're going to end the show by talking about a couple of reports involving the Detroit Tigers. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked on Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, November 20th, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked on Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers and get $150 in bonus bets. With any winning $5 money line bet, it's $150 bucks if your team wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Alrighty, well, hope everyone had a fantastic weekend. Happy Monday to all. Happy Victory Monday to all for all those Lions fans out there. Goodness gravy. What a stressful Sunday afternoon. Vomiting, puking, pacing, crying, throwing up all over my apartment. But it led to a win. So we'll take that, baby. We're not going to complain about wins in the National Football League, but uh, yeah, crazy game. Uh, be sure to check out Locked On Lions. Always a great product over there by Matt Derry as well. Uh, so let's talk about the Detroit Tigers because that's what we do here. So uh, we're going to talk about the non-tender deadline, three players that were a part of that. Two we pretty much expected, one a little bit of a curveball, but not really, no pun intended, then we're going to talk about some of the names. I'm not going to say bigger names because at the end of the day, these are guys that uh, are still like non-tender players. So, you know, we're not getting an MVP candidate out of this pool. But there is a big pool of players that are now free agents that weren't just three days ago. So we're going to talk about some of the names in there, maybe to keep an eye on. Uh, we're also going to discuss two reports involving the Tigers over the last two days. One being one of the biggest free agents in the entire class in Yamamoto, and the other being Javier Baez. Okay, so let's start by talking about this deadline on Friday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 Central. Uh, the Detroit Tigers officially non-tendered the contracts of Austin Meadows, Spencer Turnbull, and Garrett Hill. Now, on the report, there are two other names on there, Hanafi and Pacheco. Uh, but if you have your pulse on the Tigers or are an everyday or here, you're aware that those guys got DFA'd earlier in the week. And it was just the, you know, the, the, technically that the decision was made on Friday, but we knew that they were going to get DFA'd earlier. So those two weren't really a surprise. But uh, the other three were new name, new subtractions, we'll say. Uh, and none of them really shocking. Uh, we can start with Austin Meadows. We've talked about Austin Meadows at length. Uh, the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, the last couple of years at this point. And it's a really unfortunate situation. I wish they did nothing but the best. I hope that he's able to play baseball again. Uh, but the, the Tigers, I, I understand the decision that the Tigers made here. Uh, you have to put the, the job of every front office in baseball is to put the best 40 man dudes on the 40 man roster every year. And he's played 42 games in the last two seasons. And uh, it's just to a point now where uh, the reason that I understand it is because I don't think when he is a free agent, which is technically now that any team out there is going to guarantee him a 40 man roster spot. And uh, like, again, I, I, I wish to do nothing but the best, uh, and, and I hope that he's able to play again, and I hope that he finds some opportunity. I still think there is a decent chance that whether it's the Tigers or another team, that he is able to uh, get a minor league deal that will not be a 40-man roster spot, but it'll be a minor league deal so that, you know, they can kind of ease him back into it. And then if and when he is ready to play again, that team has control over him and, and can put him on their 40-man roster then. But uh, especially with one year until he was a free agent anyway. He has five years of service time under his belt. Uh, with, with one year until he was going to be a free agent anyway, that they certainly weren't going to extend him after the last couple of years. So it was either that or pay him four and a half mil. 
the decision was made. I uh, I understand it from the Tigers' perspective. Okay. Uh, again, w- wish him wish him the best with him. St- wish him strength and peace with what he's been going through over the last couple of years. Uh, we'll see if he can get a minor league deal either here or elsewhere. I'd imagine elsewhere is more likely. I mean, I like just it's not a surprise. Like Scott Harris said in his post media availability that he hadn't spoken to Meadows in months. He said it had been like since June or July that he had spoken to him. It doesn't really sound like a relationship where uh, the the team is like chomping at the bit to get this dude back on the field and, and back under contract. So uh, really unfortunate. We'll see how that situation develops. We'll keep an eye on Meadows going forward. But uh, I, I would imagine that the conversations, you know, like every single episode or once a week or whatever, just about, you know, updating update on Austin Meadows are probably gone. Uh, and it's probably in uh, in. in probably what needed to happen uh, for maybe both parties even. Obviously, I don't know Austin. But uh, then Spencer Turnbull, the other one, uh, not a surprise either. <laughs> to me, at least. Uh, there were some people that that thought that Turnbull was going to get a – was going to get taken to arbitration. They were going to try to make him a reliever next year. That was kind of like – there was an impression by some out there that that might happen. I don't know anything y'all don't know. I don't have like an inside, you know, edge on the relationship between Turnbull and the front office. But from the outside looking in, there is no way it's good. <laughs> and, and that's an assumption on my part. Uh, but I think it's it's probably a pretty accurate one. I, there is just no way that after what happened this year, and I don't, I don't want to lay out his calendar again, for you know the third time in three consecutive episodes, basically, but there, there's just no way. There, there's no way that both parties are looking at each other, going, "Oh yeah, like I'm really fond of of this of this person." Just one guy that really wanted to stay in the majors, so that his major league service clock was ticking. And an organization that looked at the results and looked at the injury history and said, "We're not going to guarantee you that roster spot." And now here we are. So. Uh, I will guarantee that Spencer Turnbull is going to get work elsewhere. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be a rotation spot. I think it's, I'm not sure there's a major league team out there that after his last two calendar years, which is one missed entirely due to injury and another missed in large part due to injury. And also just like when he was on the field, it wasn't very productive, uh, I, I can't imagine that someone's just going to go, oh, yeah, 30, 31 years old. We're going to make you part of the rotation. But uh, he'll he'll get he'll get opportunities. Uh, he he has too good of stuff to just completely kind of pass by uh, pass by the wayside. So we will see what happens. And then when it comes to Garrett Hill, he was the one that wasn't really on the radar of uh, I don't want to say like not on anybody's radar to get non-tendered. But uh, with guys that aren't arbitration eligible, uh, because they make close to, if not league minimum money, you can just DFA them like whenever, kind of like for, for lack of a better term, right? You don't need to de- like non-tender him. They could have DFA'd him three weeks from now. It, you know what I mean? So uh, they wanted to get out ahead of it, obviously. And uh, and obviously there's some financial stuff in there. There is there is a little bit of incentive to do it when they did it. I'm not trying to make it sound like it was just uh uh, you know, n- nothing, but, uh, yeah, look, he has, he has big command issues, substantial command issues. Uh, I Garrett Hill in spring training was somebody that I kind of liked when they moved him to the bullpen because he has a mid to even upper nineties at times sinker when he comes out of the pen. Uh, but he walks everyone. Like he, he just has such significant command issues at the present moment that I, I don't think anyone is uh, too upset or confused by the decision to non-tender him either. So uh, it, it, I'm hoping that he's able to go somewhere. And again, that'll be a minor league deal for sure, whether it's here or elsewhere, probably elsewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that someone is able to get their hands on him and uh, and make some adjustments to his mechanics to give him some better command because he has good re- multi-inning reliever stuff. He, he just the, the command issues are so substantial. Uh, in in the year 2023, at least, that uh, I don't think anyone can be too mad about this. And, and understandable, understandable decision by the Tigers. So now the Tigers' 40-man roster is at 37 players. 37. So we got three openings in the short term. 
uh, and still several guys that you could very easily uh, DFA or get rid of off the 40 man roster if you were to bring in more than three players as well. So uh, that is your current and up to date 40 man roster. Let's talk about some of the names around baseball who got DFA'd or non tendered rather on Friday. We'll do that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at FanDuel. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. This was a very, very fun weekend at FanDuel. Just some great college football games, some great NFL games. Very fun. The player props are nothing short of incredible. And Thanksgiving, right around the corner, now is is a really fun time because there are always some really fun player props and fun bets for the Thanksgiving games. So uh, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to kick off the NFL season. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. All right, everybody, welcome back here at segment two of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all greatly for tuning in. Uh, thank you for making us your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow. I don't know if it'll be tomorrow's show or later in the week, but we are going to have an episode just talking about potential starting pitching free agents that the Tigers can bring in. The first domino of free agency has kind of fallen with Nola going back to Philly on a seven-year deal. We'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of this show and then whenever we talk about starting the starting pitching market as it is this week as well. Uh, but today we're talking about the non-tender deadline that happened over the weekend. Um, so I just want to kind of riff a little bit about some interesting players who got non-tendered. Uh, I mean, Kyle Lewis is one that kind of jumps off the page immediately. And and before I have to I have to to defend myself here, I'm I'm not saying that every single person I'm bringing up is someone I want the Tigers to go get. I don't think the Tigers have room for another outfielder who, especially unfortunately with the season that uh, that Lewis just had, really really struggled in limited time at the plate uh, and, and kind of just hasn't been the same since his rookie of the year campaign in the short 2020 season. So um, uh, yeah, not every single name I bring up is like, he's interesting because the Tigers should get him just, just purely riffing about some interesting names out there. Uh, but Kyle Lewis just given like only three years removed from a rookie of the year and, and is now like bouncing around team to team and like, can't really just like get his feet under him. I think that he'll be a guy that he's still young enough where I fully expect some team to take a chance on him still. Uh, but interesting to see his name there. Uh, we do have a couple of names that I do want to bring up in regards to the Tigers. We'll get to those in a second. I think Adam Simber, he had a really rough year this year, but um, at one point uh, was, a, was a pretty highly regarded reliever. So that's kind of interesting. Obviously, like Vogelbach and and, and Telez, right? Rowdy Telez are guys that uh, – didn't have great years this year and have been kind of the source of turmoil within their own fan bases, Vogelbach especially. Um, but uh, if a team, there's going to be some team out there that needs a first baseman or a DH and, and we'll give both of those guys a job. Won't be the Detroit Tigers, however. And then the big one, Brandon Woodruff. Let's talk about him for a second. So uh, some people just really quickly why this happened. Some people just confused about why the Brewers are non-tendering one of the better pitchers in the history of their franchise. Uh, this one is he has a year left until he becomes a free agent. The Brewers have made it pretty clear, I think, already this offseason and really over the last two offseasons, that they don't plan on spending big money. And he, Woodruff is hurt for presumably all of 2024. So... The decision was, if we're not going to extend him anyway, why would we give him $11.5 million in arbitration to just ride the pine all year this year? Let's just get ahead of this and just non-tender him now. And that's what they did. Uh, so just like that, again, probably not going to pitch in all of 2024. However, when healthy, he is one of the best pitchers in the game of baseball and has been one of the better pitchers in the National League for the last several years. And like I said, is, is legitimately one of the best pitchers in the history of the Milwaukee Brewers. So, when it comes to the Detroit Tigers, 
I think that when we're discussing what teams are going to have to do to sign Woodruff, obviously no one is signing him to a one-year deal. That just makes no sense. You're going to sign him to a one-year deal. He's not going to pitch. I think that it's either going to have to be straight up a two or it's a one and one option. One year, you can just ride the pine. We'll pay you to rehab. Then there's a team option. We see how you've been pitching. We see how you've developed in your rehab. And we are going to either exercise or not exercise that team option. I think there's a chance that happens. I also think there's a chance that a three-year contract with a team option is possible. Right? Okay, we'll give you your two-year deal. One of those, you're just going to rehab the whole time. The next one, you'll pitch. The third one is our call. I'd imagine he will want to be a free agent as soon as possible. So maybe the team option in year three isn't something that he would want. Uh, But no one is going to sign him to a one-year deal. So he's going to have to at least be okay with the two-year deal or the one-in-one option. I mean, would I be upset if the Detroit Tigers did it? No, uh, definitely not. That, that'd be kind of exciting for the rotation in 2025. Um, but it also would be spending however much money. Uh, the, the arbitration projection for him was about 11 and a half mil. I mean, you'd, you'd be spending however much money for your issue in 2024 to not be solved at all. So if that's like something they do, then great. Uh, But like you still have to address starting pitcher in 2024. Okay. But obviously if it was announced tomorrow that the Tigers signed Woodruff to a two-year deal, I would not be upset about that. I would just say, okay, that's great. That's awesome. I'm super pumped. I hope we didn't spend any of our budget for 2024 rotation on him. I hope that that was like an extra cherry on top thing because we still need a lot of innings in 2024. Okay. So hopefully I articulated my point well there. Um, some other names, mostly on, there's a ton of like relievers that always get non-tendered every year. So there, there's a quite a few pitchers. We could talk about that for a while. Um, but there are a couple of bats that I have been asked about that. I just wanted to address publicly because, uh, that's what the whole point of this show is. So, uh, Nick Senzel, is one that I've already been asked about a few times over the weekend. Uh, This past season in 330 plate appearances, he had an 85 OPS plus, a 236 average, 297 OVP, and a 399 slug. He had 13 homers and 42 RBIs. Uh, Fangraphs had him at just barely negative war. Baseball reference had him at exactly 0.00 war. So, With Senzel, I think the reason that some people point to him and go Scott Harris guy is because he played seven positions, seven positions in six positions in 2023. He played all three outfield positions and he played two or I don't, I guess he probably didn't play shortstop this year. So played five different positions this year, including all three outfield and second and third base. Um, I want to cite a conversation we had. This is for, for people that have been supporting the show for a while. I want to cite a conversation we had about Harold Castro a lot. Okay. Everyone always loved to talk about how Harold Castro had value because he played a lot of different positions. And my counter argument to that was that's great that he plays a lot of positions, He doesn't play a single one of them well, though. So how valuable is that, really? How valuable is playing five, six, seven different positions when you are comfortably negative in just about all of them, with the exception of maybe like one? Um, To me, that kind of ruins the versatility a little bit. And Senzel, while he was around net zero at second and third, either minus one or zero in OAA at those two positions, he was comfortably negative in the three outfield positions, and it led to his overall OAA on the season being negative seven, 
which is pretty well under zero. Negative four in left field alone. Right? So, and, you know, we have a lot of outfield depth. Uh, unless unless he's playing a decent center field when, when Meadows is having a, an off day, uh, we, I, we don't really need him to play too much outfield if, he, if we were to bring him in. So how much do you value a second slash third baseman that was 15% worse than league average, had a sub 400 slug, even with 13 homers? He doesn't walk too much, but he also doesn't swing and miss a lot and he doesn't chase a lot. I think that those are Scott Harris traits, right? Low whiff rate, low chase rate, has like lower strikeout rate, but doesn't walk too terribly much. We're really picking hairs here. I, I think if you were to compare him to maybe some of the other utility depth in the organization, you could argue that it would be an upgrade. This guy at one point in his life was a one of the top prospects in the entire game of baseball. He's going to be on some people's radar, but there are a lot of flaws still, which is obviously, again, why all of these dudes were non-tendered. Uh, I don't think he's going to be like a high priority. I don't need Senzel on my baseball team next year. If it were to happen, I wouldn't be like, oh my goodness, this is the worst move ever. Uh, but uh, at that point, we'd just be like arguing that we're upgrading over like McKinstry, Ibanya. Like we're, how much How much does a, does a slight upgrade in utility infielder going to affect next season? How much does he really fit your profile, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, there's one more guy on here that I've been asked about that I think makes a little bit more sense, but is kind of still in a similar conversation. We will talk about him right after this. All right, everybody, welcome back. Your third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in, making us your first listen every day. Uh, So we just talked about Nick Senzel. Not like in love with the idea, uh, not someone that's going to be a high priority for me. Hasn't really hit well in a few years. And yeah, uh, the positional versatility is, is, is great, but it's not as needed for the little offense that he provides. And the next person on this list is somewhat similar, but I think maybe a little bit better of a fit. And that is Garrett Hampson. Uh, Hampson is a utility player played quite a few different positions for the Marlins this year as well. His stats, he had a 98 OPS plus, so just about a league average hitter in OPS uh, in just under 100 games played. He had a 276 average, a 349 OVP, a 380 slug, only had three home runs and 23 RBIs. Uh, He was just above zero war on fan graphs and was 1.3 war on baseball reference. Um, So, yeah, I, this one makes if if I had to choose between Hampson and Senzel, I would choose Hampson. Uh, about the same age, Hampson might be a little bit older. He's twenty nine. Uh, Hampson is another guy that doesn't chase, has good chase rates, uh, does not swing and miss a whole lot, has pretty good whiff rates, strikeout numbers uh, below league average. Not gonna not going to not strike out a few double negative there. He's going to get his strikeouts. He's not, you know, like 30, 35% of the time or anything egregious like that, but worse than league average. Uh, But his walk rate is a little bit closer to 10%. And each of the last two years has been well over 9%. So uh, above league average and walking commands the strike zone, positional versatility, can play shortstop, obviously, like he's not going to be the starting shortstop, you know, for all those people that just wanted to run Javi out of town. Not saying that that's going to happen, but he has played outfield. He has played three different infield positions. He has some positional versatility there, hit pretty well this season, and is one of the fastest players in the entire game of baseball. He's in the 98th percentile in sprint speed which I think adds a layer to his value as well. So uh, he's a guy that I legitimately think we should keep an eye on. Uh, And and again, this is a non-tender, okay? I'm not trying to convince you that Garrett Hampson is going to come in and be an Uh, all-star. He's going to be a utility player. But that is one where I actually do think there is a chance that he could be a sizable upgrade over some of the utility players that we currently have on the roster. 
okay? Uh, not a game-changing thing, and if they decide not to do it, so be it. I, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. And at the end of the day, this is a guy whose OPS was in the 500s in 2022. <laughs> His last three years OPS, 669, 594, 729 for a career 676. Very little power, right? Uh, but I think he does the the control the strike zone thing at a decent rate and uh, can walk a decent amount, plays multiple positions, and is very athletic. I think that there's a chance that that kind of fits the profile that the Tigers are going for. But again, not gonna not gonna lose sleep if they don't bring him in because uh, he he's a non tender for the Marlins that had an OPS in the 500s uh, a year and a half ago. Okay. So just some interesting names that I wanted to bring up there. Let's talk about some reports out of Tigers camp this weekend. One that Javi Baez is spending a lot of time in Tampa. He is working with a highly regarded hitting coach and is trying to work out specific muscles that are trying that he is trying to uh, improve the bat speed and make it so that he can get around on specifically fastballs more. That's something that we cited a lot over the calendar year on this show. And yeah, you know, that, that's great. <laughs> I, I mean, like, what do you, what do you want from him? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just, he's really caught between a rock and a hard place here. As far as like public perception, I don't think anybody is hearing this news and is like, oh my goodness, Javi's going to be back. He's going to OPS, you know, 790 or 800. Everything is solved. I don't think there's a single soul on the planet that thinks that way. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm glad we're getting this report as opposed to, like him just doing nothing about it. I mean, I guess I'm glad that he's he's doing something different. This is not something he usually does in the offseason. Usually he just goes home to Puerto Rico. So like this is this is a, a, a step, I guess. This is good to hear. But I, I don't think anyone is is like over the moon until they see the results of the labor. Uh, and then we'll see if that happens in spring training. So I don't have too much to add. Evan Petzold had a great story about it for the free. Um, there's been a few articles about it out there. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I don't have, I don't have too much to like add. It, it's a, it's a great report. I'm glad he's doing something, but, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I don't know. I, I feel like at this point, most of the fan base, myself included with him at the batter's box, at least is just like, I'll see it when I believe it. So we'll see it when we believe it, or we'll believe it when I see it. That's the way it goes. Not the other way around. Uh, the last one, then I'll let you go about your Monday the last thing here is going to be Yamamoto. Uh, if you are unaware, Yoshinobu Yamamoto is one of the most sought-after free agents in all of baseball. Uh, there's a legitimate argument that it's Otani, Yamamoto, right behind him, right? Maybe not right behind him, but number two, <laughs> uh, Otani is, is Otani. And it was reported John Heyman has been just pumping out Yamamoto updates all off season. It feels like once every five days, we have like a list of teams that are interested in Yamamoto. Uh, I'm not trying to be a Debbie downer here. Okay. So if, if you just want to go into this and you're like, you know what? I want to believe that Yamamoto has a chance of being a tiger. Then, then more power to you. Okay. Don't let me be the one to derail your optimism. But when I see that headline, it's like tigers interested in Yamamoto. That that's great. I'm interested in becoming a billionaire tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty interested in that. I'm interested in eating mac and cheese and drinking chocolate milk like a five-year-old every single day and having that be, you know, my body not explode in a month. Uh, I'm interested in a lot of stuff that's just like not <laughs> – like, like feasible, right? Like it's, that's great that you're interested in one of the most highly regarded and best players on the free agent market. That's awesome. Uh, that I, I guess it's like a step because the Tigers have never even been in consideration or in these conversations for like interested in player, especially in the Japanese market. The Tigers don't usually play that game. So I guess like some people are taking a victory lap that we're even being discussed. Uh, that that's great. That's awesome. But I, I don't know. Uh, like I, I, I tweeted this out on Friday in the article. Like the article where the report happened literally had a quote in there from Scott Harris where he came out and said, uh, the, uh, this is not verbatim at all, uh, but it, paraphrasing, it was essentially 
we are not we don't want to be a team that spends before they're ready to spend was essentially what the report was or what the quote was. And he's like, we see it time after time. There's so many teams that, uh, that, that spend before they're ready to spend. And then now here we are and, and it, it, it bites them long-term. Okay. That that's really injecting optimism into me. I, I read that quote and I think, wow, we're in on Yamamoto. Like, <laughs> Uh, and Scott Harris has said that he really wants to like have a, a, a pipeline where he wants to really be a, a factor in the Japanese market. That's all awesome. That is great to hear. I'm so excited about that. I, I hope that it comes true. There's a difference between getting a relationship with the Japanese market and signing one of the best pitchers on the market for $200 million projected salary. It's going to take a lot of money. And Nola is a 31-year-old that just got seven years for almost $25 million a year. Starting pitchers are all thanking Nola and Dombrowski. So I'm glad we're interested. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. Really glad to hear that we're interested. But pretty much zero part of me thinks that we're like actually in on Yamamoto, though. All Harris has done in the last three months has just talk about how he doesn't want to like spend huge money (laughs) or like they're going to be cautious about allocating their resources. I would love to be wrong because this dude's incredible. Okay. He's incredible. And I would love nothing more than to be wrong. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow talking about, well, it might not be tomorrow's episode. Sometime this week we'll be talking about starting pitchers. we got a few more things to discuss as well. All right, peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all then, baby. Go Tigers.